The octopus can sleep by day or night. It rests in a hole to stay out of sight. And when safely sleeping with nothing to fear, it may still change colors. The reason's not clear. Welcome to Wild Development Studio. Join us as we venture into the breathtaking realm of wildlife arts and untamed adventures. With captivating stories from the field and ideas to dive into the visual arts, we'll ignite your passion for conservation. Get ready to develop something wild. Welcome to a special episode of Wild Developments. I'm your host, Lauren, and I am thrilled to have you with us today because we are celebrating World Oceans Day. The official date falls on June 8th every year, but in case you missed it, no worries. Every day should be World Oceans Day because we cannot survive without it. Our oceans cover more than 70% of the Earth's surface and are home to a vast array of incredible creatures, each with their own unique stories and behaviors. They play a critical role in regulating our climate, supporting marine and terrestrial life, and providing a source of livelihood and nourishment for billions of people around the world. World Oceans Day is a significant occasion to raise awareness about the vital importance of our oceans and the urgent need to protect them. From overfishing and plastic pollution to climate change and habitat destruction, our oceans face numerous threats. It is imperative that we take collective action to preserve and restore the health of our oceans for future generations. On this special occasion, we are diving into the enchanting world of marine life with a spotlight on a delightful book, Where Do Ocean Creatures Sleep? We are honored to welcome the book's authors for today's episode, Stephen Simmons and his son Clifford Simmons. Steve has a background as a professor of law and government, a White House aide on domestic policy, and a leader in the cable industry. Stephen graduated from Cornell University and Harvard Law School and has taught constitutional law in a course on Congress at the University of California. His academic writings have been featured in prestigious journals. In addition to his academic and professional achievements, Stephen also is a celebrated author of children's books. His best-selling book, Alice and Greta, A Tale of Two Witches, was inspired by moments of playful creativity with his children. Stephen's passion for storytelling has brought joy to countless young readers, also joining us today is Cliff. His lifelong passion for writing and love for his nieces and nephews fuels his enthusiasm for children's literature. With a background at Google and now running his own business, Cliff brings a fresh perspective to their co-authored works. Together, Steve and Cliff have crafted a magical journey through the ocean's depths, exploring the intriguing question, where do ocean creatures sleep? Their book offers a whimsical yet educational glimpse into the nighttime habits of marine animals perfect for young readers and ocean enthusiasts alike. It's Steve and Cliff, thank you guys so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you guys. In my hands, I have Where Do Ocean Creatures Sleep at Night? It is a beautiful book. I absolutely love it. My nephews love it. What inspired you guys to write this book focusing on ocean creatures? Well, it really started uh, It's part of a three book series and it started when uh, I looked around my backyard in Greenwich about seven years ago and saw all the creatures, butterflies and bumblebees, squirrels, rabbits, birds, of course. And I thought, boy, this would be a wonderful children's book uh, if I could write about how uh, when the children went to sleep, how did, how did creatures sleep or rest? What did they do? So Charles Bridge published that about three years ago, and then Cliff had been so uh, helpful in his creative input on the first book. I said, Cliff, come join me. Let's co-author the second book. And he did, and that was a continuation of the theme, and it's where do big creatures sleep at night? So focusing on gorillas and elephants and lions, where, you know, giraffes, how do they sleep at night or rest? And then, uh, the third book came naturally to Cliff and I. I mean, we love the ocean. We've snorkeled at the Great Barrier Reef uh, in the Caribbean and Hawaii. We love the ocean, we love swimming in it, surfing in it, being with it. We love to see the, uh, the birds that fly over it, whether it's uh, pelicans or seagulls. So we, uh, we loved doing this book about ocean creatures and it, you know, really came to us that it would be so interesting to write about how 
an octopus sleeps or how does a whale sleep or how does a starfish or, or pardon me, a seahorse sleep. So starfish was one we were going to do, but decided not to. But in any event, uh, yeah, that's how it happened. About two years ago, I did a night dive in St. Croix and I'll have to send you guys a picture. I got a green sea turtle sleeping in a big sponge and his like back end just kind of hanging out of it is the funniest thing and he's asleep in a giant sponge um the octopus were awake and moving so i was thinking about that night dive a lot as i was reading this book I, was that something you guys always wanted to do was to write children's books or it just came to you one day when you were outside like you said well, my dad um, has written lots of children's books before this series. So even when I was growing up in the 90s, you know, I was always inspired watching him write, whether it's Alice and Greta, um, Jasper, The Fish Who Saved a Marriage, Percy the Pigeon. So I, I got to to grow up watching him you know, write those children's books and also read those books to me. Um, and so when we had the opportunity to partner up together for this series of books, um, it obviously made it all, all the more special. That is amazing. I and mean I work with my husband and it can be quite challenging to work with a family <laughs> member. How is the dynamics like for you two? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think it's great. Um, I think we know each other so well that we know one another's strengths and weaknesses and work styles. Um, and yeah, I've always admired my dad's work ethic from a professional standpoint. So getting to see that up close and personal on a, on a, on a, a project like this where we're working so closely, I think it's been really rewarding and, and has made it fun. So did you learn anything new about your dad, like seeing the business side of him? <laughs> I learned, that's a good question. I learned, uh, I always knew he was very thorough and uh, and thoughtful about the way that he conducts work, but I think I learned that firsthand, just the thoroughness with which we create each and every draft and do our do our reviews. And again, I was learning from him a bit in the process because he's he's gone through this process before in publishing books. So I would say that I would say that uh, the the thoroughness and kind of the thoughtfulness you put into oh, the process. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, did you learn anything about your son and his work ethic during this process? I did. I I felt that um, I just continue to be extraordinarily impressed with Cliff's creative genius. And he is able to see things and see ideas that didn't occur to me. And uh, it's wonderful to see your son who, you know, you knew as a little boy and first help him ride his bicycle and <laughs> help him walk to see him now coming up, being ahead of you in kind of some of these creative creative endeavors, which is amazing to see. I might add just very quickly that Cliff referred to other books and so forth. All of the books I've read and Cliff and I have, pardon me, all of the books I've done, written, and books that Cliff and I have written are on our website, simmonsbooks.com. That's Simmons, S-I-M-M-O-N-S, simmonsbooks.com. And we also have an Instagram account, at Simmons Stories at Simmons Story. So we'd uh, encourage people to just go there and take a look around, also have a lot of reviews and comments people have on the work, so it's fun. And I'll be sure to tag uh, both the sites that you just mentioned in the show description so people, as they're listening, can hop right over Thanks. and check you guys out for sure. <laughs> Thank you. When you guys are writing this series of books on where animals sleep at night, what animals are you inspired to write about had like how, what's the process like in picking those animals we it's a pretty pretty intensive and thorough process i mean it's it's really based on two things at the end of the day when once we narrow it down it's what animals are going to have the most interesting facts about their sleep habits that'll be exciting and educational for young kids and then secondly uh which animals uh, do we feel we're going to be able to bring alive with the illustrations in the most interesting way? So those are kind of the two key criteria. But first, we we create a very extensive list. So we go through and and just like a lot of things with writing, it's the hard part is narrowing it down afterwards. Um, once we create this initial list, 
um, and then write write drafts and and do all the research, of course, about about all of their their daytime and their nighttime habits. And then from there, we narrow it down based really based on those two criteria that I mentioned. Yeah, like the parrotfish. I've yet to see that in the wild, but that is such a crazy story about how they make a focus protection ball around them during their sleep habits. As far as your research goes, what does that look like? Are you guys calling zoologists or? Yeah, we decided to keep it to the online effort. And, but it wasn't just like Googling one source mm -hmm. for every animal sleep habits, we probably did, I don't know, four to six sources, which would refer to uh, oceanography journals and would refer to research by people at various centers. Um, and sometimes we found that sources conflicted about uh, sleep habits. You know, they just didn't know. So we that would take us to more research. And and then sometimes sleep habits differed in captivity versus not. Mm. So that was especially true in the big creatures book. But um, yeah, so that's kind of how it was. And then uh, we divided up the creatures once we, as Cliff well says, we met once we narrowed the list. So I was responsible for a certain number. Cliff was responsible for a certain number. <laughs> And then we get together, and uh, so yeah, it was a. You know, you want it to be accurate, so you had to you had to check a number of sources to do that. So yeah, yeah. Did you find that it was more difficult researching ocean animals just because that's such a foreign environment for humans? Mm -hmm. you don't really see that at night. Well, I think it was certainly more difficult than backyard creatures for sure it was yes I, I think the answer is yes it was more difficult than uh big creatures as well although as i said in big creatures you got differing information sometimes by observing a big creature in captivity how it slept versus perhaps in the wild how it slept but i think yes i think on uh on ocean creatures it was a little bit Perhaps more challenging, yeah, because so many of these creatures are sleeping out in the middle of the ocean. You know, the ocean covers seven about 71% of the Earth's surface. It's this enormous, enormous part of our world, and uh, some places is miles deep, you know? And so not everything has been exactly researched to a T on sleeping habits, but... Uh, we managed to find enough sources to be comfortable to put it in. And sometimes, you know, there'd be uh, things that creatures would do that people didn't know. For example, several sources said that when, well, let's take an octopus. An octopus can change colors to, to camouflage itself as it goes around coral reefs or rocks and so forth. Uh, and then uh, one source said that when an octopus sleeps in a, in a hole or something like that. It also changed colors. Now it's clearly asleep, so it's not trying to camouflage itself against uh, an attack. And the common theory seemed to be that, uh, you know, it was probably having dreams, some kind of dreams and changing. Now, I we didn't put that in because there were differing opinions, but we said, People can't, you know, people can't agree on why, uh, you know, the octopus changes color. In fact, I can probably just pop this up right here. Let's see. Uh, we said, and I'll read this, just, I'll read the octopus section if that's okay here. Absolutely, yeah. It's beautiful. Um, and by the way, we start each, with each of these creatures, we start, with some activities during the day and what they do uh, when they're not resting or sleeping, and then we go into sleeping habits. I'll also mention, as you can see from the spectacular illustration, Ruth Harper, we were so lucky to get the award-winning Ruth Harper to do this series of books with us. She's spectacular. But an octopus can change the color of its skin to hide from others as it blends in. 
It has many arms, eight to be exact. And if it loses an arm, a new one grows back. The octopus can sleep by day or night. It rests in a hole to stay out of sight. And when safely sleeping with nothing to fear, it may still change colors for reasons not clear. So, uh, yeah, that's an example of where we were looking at what scientists were saying, but there didn't seem to be a consensus. So, that is so fascinating that a simple question for a children's book, where do ocean creatures sleep at night, brings to light areas in science that maybe they need to do a little bit more research and we can learn more about these animals. And that brings up the topic of ocean conservation and getting kids hooked at a really early age. What are some ways that we can get our children active in conservation? One is uh, have them read our book, <laughs> Where Do Ocean Creatures? Because it really gets them, I think, interested in the ocean, uh, in the environment. Uh, I mean, we, of course, hope this will be a wonderful nighttime book where a parent or a sibling will cuddle up with uh, a child and read it as a, as a nighttime book. But we also hope it's going to be a, or a child will read it uh, him, him or herself. Uh, but we also hope it's a book that will encourage interest in the oceans and, and the creatures that live in it. Uh, but beyond that, I think it's always important, like I did with Cliff and the other kids I've had, uh, to bring them to aquariums so that they can see uh, 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 ocean creatures and uh, right up close and personal. Uh, I think it's uh, helpful if they take a look at some wonderful documentaries that are available today to watch on television, uh, Blue Planet and a bunch of others. You just uh, go and look, but I think, uh, and then I think it's important for parents and schools to talk about um, the oceans. And and as I said, it, it covers so much of our planet and, um, you know, how important it is to preserve it um, for future generations. The co-founder of Only One, the organi organization focused on Advancing Ocean Protection endorsed your guys' book. How did that feel? That must have been pretty amazing. Yeah, it's exciting. It's exciting and just and just validating in terms of uh, you know the work we put into it and and the the facts about these creatures and how how interesting they are um, and and of course accurate. So yeah, it was it was that was an exciting milestone. I would say, Dad. Yeah, no, I agree, Cliff, and and. Uh... If you go to that website I talked about, you know, there are also a bunch of other marine biologists and people that have written books about the ocean who have endorsed this book as well. So it's very satisfying to see that. And it's, as Cliff well said, validated, you know. That's amazing. At the end of the book, you guys note how sleep is important for children as well. Why do you feel like that was an important thing to include at the end of the book? I think I think we wanted the book to have a message, right? And then, you know, clearly we knew it was going to be a great bedtime story um, to be read to, to children. So not only something with exciting and cool illustrations for kids and then something that would teach them new facts that would kind of, you know, make their eyes wide, right? But given the whole theme of the book, one of the one of the things we loved about this concept in the series is that it made for a perfect bedtime story, um, just given given the theme and the content of of the book. And so we really wanted it to have uh, a broader message at the end each time where we tie it back um, as a learning for why sleep is also so important for young kids. And we thought that's, that's only going to benefit the kids more. I think that's that's going to make parents appreciate the book even more, not only educating them about these animals, but also then, then rounding them back to that message about why sleep is important for, for humans too. Yeah, and exactly right. And just as these creatures need their rest for sleep so that they can have energy for the next day's activities, so it is that children need their sleep. So they'll have their own energy for the next day to learn, to develop their bodies, to enjoy all the activities that they're going to have in the following day.
So I have a 15 year old and he is at the point in his life where he's like, I read all day at school and I don't want to read anymore. So I have started family reading time and we all read for about 15 minutes. And I'm like, I don't care what it is, as long as it is something fun, but you're reading. How can we get children more interested in reading and writing? This is something critical. If you look at the averages of third graders who read at grade level, there's a, a significant percentage that do not. And if you can't read properly, it affects your entire education. How can you learn um, history? How can you learn science? How can you uh, learn social studies? How can you read the great books? And so reading is something that's absolutely 100% a, a, a basic foundation for the rest of your schooling and education, and then for the rest of your life as you go into the job market. So it's something that has to be done. I think it can't be left just to the schools, although that's obviously very important. But I think it needs to be uh, at night. And I think it starts young. I think one shouldn't wait till someone's 15 or 12. I mean, it really ought to almost begin in preschool. And I think it's very important that every child have an opportunity to start some sort of school or group experience, whatever you might call it, even before kindergarten. And it's been shown that children that have that pre-kindergarten experience uh, learn so many more words, have such a larger vocabulary. And then as they go forward, I think uh, giving them books that are of interest. We hope, hopefully like, you know, where do ocean creatures sleep at night? But there are many books. And, you know, begin earlier where you have simpler books, Pat the Bunny, or where it's uh, Good Night Moon. Uh, books that are of that nature. Uh, some boys like books about trucks, which fine, you know, it gets them to be interested. Uh, some like uh, different kinds of uh, books about dinosaurs or dinosaurs love tacos. Great. If it gets them interested in reading, uh, I think that's wonderful. These are good books to be to be read to, to children. And then I think you just keep that up. You keep up the reading. Another thing I think is important is to try to limit screen time because kids get so obsessed with videos and, uh, you know, that, that, that reading takes second, third, fourth place. And uh, look, it's fine to have some screen time, but I think it's also important to make sure that kids are reading as well. So that's kind of our approach to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, getting off the phones is definitely a crucial part to that in reading, like you said. Also, getting outside. Do you guys have a favorite moment that you've shared outside? I do. <laughs> Cliff and I, when we, uh, when we would snorkel, we'd bring back sand for his mom, my wife, Eileen, and we'd dive. Sometimes Cliff would be able to go deeper than I, so we go down and we bring back the sand up to the top and just a little bit, a pinch of it, you know, and we bring it back to, uh, and put it in a bottle for for Mrs. Simmons. So I think that was pretty special. Cliff, you, you may have some other moments, I don't know. Yeah, my dad and well, my mom too, they both got me very involved in nature at a young age and reading. So I think that, Parents have a very important role in getting their kids involved in nature and in reading, for sure. Where do you guys like to go snorkeling? Do you have a favorite spot? Yeah, well, we, uh, I don't think they don't think there is a favorite spot. I think probably the Great Barrier Reef was the most extraordinary experience. Nice. And as I was saying before, I think the Virgin Islands or down in the Caribbean has been a pretty extraordinary place. And then uh, down here in Florida, we found a couple of spots on the intercoastal that are pretty amazing. So, yeah, um, it's been it's been pretty, 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 pretty extraordinary time doing that and having fun. How 
long have you guys been snorkeling in around coral reefs and have you noticed a change over the years yeah well we've snorkeled for a long time in fact when we got back from the great barrier reef i was so taken with it and cliff was young very young at the time and i i created a, a large very large fish tank in our house salt water with corals and uh all sorts of different fishes uh cliff and his class would come over and other the other kids classes would come over and i'd give a little talk on the fish and the coral and uh they uh they'd take a look at it and be uh you know amazed by it but uh Unfortunately, because of warming of our planet, we're seeing around the world bleaching of coral. And uh, if the water gets too warm, the algae can't survive with the corals. And there's a synergistic relationship between the two and um, kind of symbiotic uh, dependency if you will, uh, coral needs the algae, the algae needs the coral. And um, as a result, we're seeing bleaching and it's, 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 it's very, very di disappointing to see that happening. And, you know, there are lots of worries from global warming, which could include melting more of the ice, um, uh, in places like Antarctica and so forth, but uh, which can result in rising seas, which can result in coastal cities uh, experiencing uh, real tragedy. Uh, so I'm not saying that the bleaching of coral is the most important consequence of global warming. There's the coastal areas, there's weather, obviously, we're seeing in the last few years changing significantly, but it's one of the uh, impacts. And, you know, these reefs, coral reefs, contain so many different species of fish and uh, so many different kinds of life uh, that uh, my sincerest hope is that uh, this bleaching does not continue in any significant way in that the coral reefs survive because uh, they really are vital to the oceans. Um, I actually just saw, I think it was Noah posted before and after of bleached coral and they actually recovered. I had always thought that once the coral had bleached, it was done for, but I guess there is some hope that they can recover, that symbiotic algae can come back. Um, which is why it's so important you guys are doing what you're doing and bringing awareness to young children and and that letting them fall in love with ocean animals. Do you guys have a fourth book in the series that you're working on? Stay stay tuned is what we'll okay. say. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Definitely have some ideas that we're bouncing around that we're excited about. Awesome. Now, Stephen, you also sculpt animals. Can you tell us about that work? Yes, uh, just uh, I began sculpting about 25 years ago, and uh, I've now gotten you know, a fair, fairly wide collection. If you want to see my sculptures, go to SimmonsSculpture.com. SimmonsSculpture.com. There's about 45 different sculptures. But yeah, there are, I've done sculptures, a lot of whales. I've fallen in love with the humpback whale. So I've done different types of humpback whales in bronze. You know, you begin them in clay. Uh, and then from the clay, you bring it to a foundry and they make it into bronze. I've done uh, stingrays, spotted stingrays, which, you know, seem to flow through the through the water. I've, I've done... Um, uh, pelicans flying over the the ocean. I've done ospreys doing the same thing. So I really, uh, you know, m most of my work on the animal side is in bronze, but I've kind of branched out also to do abstract metal works in stainless steel and aluminum. 
that can go outside and are different colors or stainless steel. Um, and I enjoy it greatly. It gives me great satisfaction to be able to do that. And uh, I'm looking at the cover of the book and I see a turtle and it reminds me I've done a, <laughs> a night, not a sea turtle, but a nice tortoise too. So, and I've also done, I think some fun, large uh, outdoor and indoor uh, sculptures of dolphins, you know, which appear in the book, you know? Uh, so I don't know, I can, you know, I love dolphins and one of the inspiring, I'll just read from the book, the dolphin, if yeah, I can just quickly it. page. A bottlenose dolphin can jump very high. It's long back arches up toward the sky. It rides waves and plays with friends. Its mouth seems to smile from end to end. A dolphin's rest is not very deep because only one side of its brain is asleep. The other side stays awake and aware so the dolphin remembers to always breathe air. So it has that blowhole, which I of course captured in the sculpture. But, uh, it's fun. So. Yeah, one of my favorite memories, I was out at Homosassa, Florida, out on a paddleboard, and I had two dolphins swim right underneath my board. Oh, it's just incredible. Marvelous, fabulous, love it. <laughs> so between writing and sculpting, when do you sleep, sir? <laughs> <laughs> well, I also have some business I take care of, but uh, you know, it's a busy, it's a busy time, busy day. Cliff also has a very busy job himself. He's very successful at digital advertising, but uh, you know, I I tend to go to sleep at night and uh, <laughs> get my get just like the. Uh, Ocean creatures, uh, uh, we all need our sleep, and as do I. So I, 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 uh, I get my eight hours. Very good. And do you guys have any long-term goals that you're hoping to accomplish together? Well, one is to, well, most importantly, father son. You know, <laughs> you're, uh, you know, it's uh, one of the most satisfying relationships and one's life, I think. So I think that's obviously the most important one is continuing to love and support and and uh, be with your son. Um, uh, Book-wise, we have a bunch of other things we're going to look at. And sculpture-wise, of course, the same thing for me. And it's been, you know, a pleasure being with you. Before we go, do we have one tip that you each have for someone that would like to reconnect with nature? Yeah, I would... Uh, you know, especially in the ocean theme, uh, I think um, walking on a beach and uh, looking out at the ocean, sitting down and watching the waves crash on that beach, thinking about the fact that this has been going on for millions of years and the sea life in that ocean has been thriving for millions of years and that it's important to keep that going. And then if you can get out on a paddleboard like you or get out on a kayak like I do and Cliff does, or just get out on a boat and uh, experience the ocean from being within it. Um, but being present, being there, not thinking about anything else, but just looking and observing the ocean, seeing the waves. Maybe you'll see some fish. Maybe you'll snorkel. Maybe you'll see, you know, some uh, birds flying overhead. I think it's a it's a great way to kind of uh, experience nature. For me, I mean, I've gotten uh, a lot more into meditating lately, and I like doing it outdoors um, as much as I possibly can, and so. Of course, just meditation aside, being out, you know, be putting yourself in nature, um, whether it's in the ocean or whether it's not in the ocean, um, as much as possible, of course, is, is going to help. But for me personally, when I can meditate outside, it feels like I'm, I'm connecting with, with nature and with earth even more so um, lately. But by doing that, so that would be a, a tip that I have. It's been really rewarding. That is great advice, guys. And thank you so much for sharing your book with the world and being on the show today. 
Until next time, get outside and see what develops. Thanks for joining Wild Development Studio. We hope this exploration into the world of wildlife arts and adventure has sparked a desire to get outside and connect with something wild. If you have an adventure that's awe-inspiring, don't hesitate to share. Click the link in the description to submit your story to have it featured on our show or be a guest. Until next time, keep connecting to the wild and see what develops. The views, opinions, and statements expressed by individuals during Wild Development Studio productions do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Wild Development Studio or its affiliates. Participation in any activities, expeditions, or adventures discussed or promoted during our content may involve inherent risks. It is strongly advised that individuals conduct thorough research, seek professional guidance, and take all necessary precautions before engaging in any such activities. Wild Development Studio, its representatives, or employees shall not be held responsible for any injury, loss, damage, accident, or unforeseen incident that may occur as a result of participating in activities inspired by or discussed in our content. By choosing to engage with our content or act upon any information provided, individuals do so at their own risk and discretion.